Dr. Banks, welcome to the show. It's great to visit with you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It is my pleasure. So tell us a little bit uh, about yourself, where you're from, and then uh, you can talk a little bit about your educational back background, uh, and then we'll transition into uh, what you do currently. Okay. So I'm originally from the state of Tennessee, where I got my undergrad at the University of Tennessee at Martin, which is like a small satellite school of UTK. Um, I actually studied millipedes, believe it or not, for my undergrad career. Oh, wow. um, from there, I moved on to uh, Troy University in Alabama, where I studied aquatic toxicology and looked at um, freshwater snails and mussels. And I looked at US EPA water quality criteria. And then I moved to Texas to start my PhD in 2015, graduated in 2019 with a, a doctorate in marine biology, and have been in Texas ever since. Okay. So in studying freshwater uh, mollusks and stuff like that, did you do a lot of stuff with zebra mussels? Because that's been, I've been doing this for almost 15 years, and it seems like zebra mussels have been a, a hot topic, uh, in Texas anyway, for the entirety of my career. Yeah, so I actually didn't use zebra mussels as my study animal. Uh -huh. I actually looked at um, federally threatened and endangered species rather than invasive. Um, but we did have a zebra mussel problem in Alabama as well. Okay. They are so starting. So what freshwater snails am I eating when I eat escargot? Or is that, are those from another country? Or those are from another there? country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Those would be French snails. They're very fancy compared to the ones I was looking at. Yeah, no, mine are These like... These are redneck snails that we're looking at. Yeah, and they're really tiny. If you're eating those, you're eating probably a <laughs> couple thousand to make a meal. Uh-huh, okay. Um, so that's your background. So yeah. tell us what you do currently at the Heart Research Institute for Gulf of Mexico Studies. So I am a research scientist here. I primarily study high, highly migratory species, so billfish, sharks, and tunas. Mm -hmm. um, however, I do a lot of fish movement studies, so I also look at a few inshore species like flounder, trout, red drum, black drum, and then my dissertation actually covered red snipper as well. So kind of okay. a, a wide species breadth. And do you like to fish yourself? Of course. Yes, I'm a big, avid fisherman, mostly offshore. I, I suck in the bay. Uh -huh. I'm one of those bay bait fishermen. <laughs> but, oh, well, you're talking that to someone that will, will drown croaker all day. I don't care. Good, we're on the same page. <laughs> yeah, bait's not a taboo offshore. No. Um, in fact, the bigger the bait, the bigger the fish. So That's right. Well, and for a lot of people, when I fish for largemouth bass, which being from North Texas, you know, that's what's king here. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I head to the coast and I get to go a couple times a year, I want to catch fish. I don't, I'm not a snob. I don't need to throw soft plastics at trout to make myself feel good. <laughs> yeah. Don't, don't tell my, my new boss that, uh, soft plastics are for snobs. Cause that's what he throws for <laughs> trout. <laughs> oh, I've done it. We, we, we went to a uh, Baffin Bay one time with a guide and it was artificial only. Yep. And, uh, yep. I caught diddly squat. I caught one really nice flounder, but I didn't catch any trout. Yeah, I'm not very good with soft plastics. Now, a yeah. spoon, I could throw a spoon, uh -huh. but I, I don't tend to do very well with soft plastics. So that's good. So you like to fish yourself because I yes. think in, and I think it's becoming more and more prevalent that we have people that get involved in um, wildlife management, research that don't hunt or fish, and they're coming at it from more of an animal rights, you know, activism background or belief system. Uh, so it's always encouraging when you're talking to somebody who's like, oh, yeah, no, I, I like to I like to kill and eat animals, too. But I also like to study them and conserve them. And, you know, it, we understand that it goes full circle. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, OK, so as far as uh, shark research goes, one of our mutual friends, Taylor Garcia, sent uh, or connected us and said that you were doing some interesting research. Uh, and this was on the heels of a recent interview I did with Mike Leonard of the American Sport Fishing Association. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that conversation, uh, I guess, in a second. But um, you guys are using satellite tracking mm -hmm. to conduct this research. Um, mm -hmm. 
And is, is this through the Heart Research Institute or through the Sport Fish Center, which might be a whole nother entity in and of itself? Yeah, so the Sport Fish Center is like the, the word center actually means something. It's not like it is designated by the state. So we are a scientific center designated by the state of Texas. Okay. And so um, we are a center within the Heart Research Institute. So the center is essentially like our lab our mm -hmm. office space and and what we research um but yeah we are part of it gets really long when we do our title because we're the center for sport fish science and conservation at the heart research institute for gulf of mexico studies mm -hmm. at Texas A &M <laughs> Corpus Christi. it gets really long if you give yeah. us like our full titles so yeah it, they're one in the same essentially if we're doing research in the sport fish center heart research is also doing that okay and so you guys are tagging sharks specifically at least in the last couple of years since I got here, we've been focusing on short fin makos. Um, that is something that I personally study. Um, for short fin makos, we were we were kind of on the forefront of that research and and finding out where they're going. So shark science, I should back up and say, is very uh, much in its infancy. We, for a lot of species, don't even know where they are going, mm -hmm. where they breed, where they pup. Um, we're just learning for some species what they're eating. And so um, this is all really important research in conserving those species and also keeping that population sustainable for fishermen who do want to harvest or who do want their kids to catch a shark in the future. Um, I study short fin makos, which recently became a prohibited species um, because in the North Atlantic, it is overfished and undergoing overfishing to the point that there's only a 50% chance that, that that this species will recover by the year 2070 if oh, wow. absolutely no other short fin mako is caught. And oh. obviously that's not possible. It's a bycatch species, right? So it's gonna have, you know, some kind of interaction with a long line or an accidental, you know, you can't control what bites your hook. It's gonna bite some yeah. fish its hook. Mm -hmm. so. So, okay, shortfin mako, I'm not familiar with this species. I mean, I know what a mako shark is, and people go to California and shoot them with a bow, and some of them are, are giant, you know. I mean, they like bow fishing these things off of a offshore boat. Um, what's what's the difference between that species and, and this one that you're studying? So there's not a lot other than they're in different geographic locations. Um, one big thing is mako sharks actually incorporate two species. They're short fin mako and then long fin mako. Both are prohibited. Long fin's been prohibited for a very long time and short fin just recently became prohibited, but only in the North Atlantic because mm -hmm. that is where ours, ours don't truly interact with those in the Pacific. So you could still go catch short fin makos in the Pacific. You cannot in the Atlantic anymore. Okay. Um, so that's the species that we're talking about specifically what has been the most well first of all how do you catch these things and tag them right really then, big baits <laughs> okay um we do actually you, are fish, do you actively participate in the catching um yeah we actually fish a little differently so if we are fishing scientifically we are permitted to fish more commercial gear so we fish hand lines so instead of using well you're a bass fisherman so instead of using like 10 15 pound test you know, at your heaviest, I'm using 1500 pound test. Okay. Um, and then it's attached to a buoy. So just like in Jaws, when they hit the hook, they take that buoy under and run. And then we chase the buoy down with a boat. And then you fight by hand to bring the shark close to the boat. Um, we can land them faster that way. They're landed green that way. So they're still, you know, healthy. We are able to go through the tagging process and release them with pretty good success. And what kind of technology is associated with the, the tags? And how are you tracking their movement? So we use, good question. We use satellite tags, which I haven't have one here. Okay. And so these allow us to track the shark anywhere in the world. So this is a wet dry sensor. So when these break the surface of the water with the fin, it sends a location to the satellite and we're able to see that location along with the date time stamp. And so that allows us to see where that fish is going. We have other technology that would require like a listening station, um, or, you know, for the shark to be recaptured. And so this is a little better technology. It's also a little more expensive. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Um, so back to that conversation with Mike, 
and I don't know, maybe it, this obviously doesn't relate as much to the short fin mako since they're protected species, but, you know, I think we've heard about, you know, shark numbers declining globally for mm -hmm. uh, as long as I can remember, but it wasn't really something that we knew a lot about mm -hmm. and that a lot, I don't think a lot of people really cared, to be honest with you. They saw jaws and they're like, yeah, screw sharks, fine, whatever. Yeah. Jaws um, was detrimental to the shark population. Right. But we do have this problem now, uh, certainly in the Gulf, where recreational anglers are losing a lot of their catch to, you know, the tax man, the shark. Um, I don't know which species. I, Mike said uh, bull shark was very uh, instrumental in that, in those confrontations. Uh, but also when you're trying to release fish too, you know, we don't, we don't keep everything like tarpon fishing, for example. Nobody's eating a tarpon. So it's all catch and release, but these sharks, uh, either their numbers have rebounded or they've learned to target fishing vessels. Um, and it's causing, you know, a little bit of an issue. Uh, I don't know if that's something that you guys are, you know, keyed in on or focused on, but um, how are shark numbers better than they were 20 years ago? So in, in the Gulf of Mexico anyway? Yeah, so the Gulf actually, and in most of the United States, we have healthy shark populations. Globally, sharks are still in trouble, but the United States has done very good about managing our shark populations. Yes, there is a shark depredation issue. We're not even going to skirt that issue. That is a problem. But mm -hmm. that is kind of a mix of what you said um, with shark numbers going up, which is good, and then a learned behavior. So there is research out there suggesting that sharks are learning the sound of certain motors so they know hey i'm coming to you know that sound sharks actually hang around fish cleaning stations right that's a free meal that's a learned yeah. behavior fish cleaning stations are not natural don't and feed so, the bears don't feed the bears exactly yeah. don't feed the sharks don't yeah. feed the dolphins yeah. all of it but you know there's some of that is a learned Ooh. behavior and so there's not much you know we can do behaviorally to deter that except i will say we are starting a project in the spring looking at some changes to terminal tackle that might help decrease some of those negative interactions. Okay. Um, so we were just funded and like I said, it's gonna start in the spring to look at different types of weights that are made of like different materials. Um, and so uh, you can look at like shark bands has one that we're gonna test to see if that helps deter sharks from taking you know your fish off your line when you're coming up. Um, and then there's also another type of prototype that's out that has um it does like an electrical pulse or a magnetic pulse that's supposed to deter sharks in the area from coming anywhere near where this this machine is in the water so mm. results to come but we are looking into that issue we do know that it is a problem so mike mentioned he didn't really have a lot more information on that but he did mention like the pulsating thing that was you know he'd heard about that but my question was well how does you know, how does that deter sharks, but not deter the fish that you actually want to catch? So that's what we're actually going to test with that. So sharks have very sensitive noses. And so that electrical pull should push them away. Um, but we are going to look at catch rates to make sure that's not decreasing catch rates mm -hmm. of fish as well. Um, mm -hmm. My guess is it, it might have some impact, but I don't think it'll be that significant because fish and sharks kind of interact with their environment a little differently. Mm -hmm. so. um one other thing i asked mike about is the you know the i think it's mostly asian markets that really have a thirst for shark fin soup mm -hmm. and we you know and, you, and people have seen these images of just hundreds of shark fins you know laid out on the deck of a boat well, okay all those sharks are dead it's not a good look but um has the I guess the uh, the decrease in the demand for shark fin soup possibly led to an influx of, of shark numbers. Um, the, well, if there's a true decrease, then yes, there could be an influx mm -hmm. in shark numbers. But most of that's probably from just the extra protection that we're out now adding to sharks. Um, and I'm, I'm going to reiterate that we want sharks in our environment not the negative interaction with your catch, but you do right. want sharks in your environment if you like seafood, if you like fishing. Um, and so, yes, having more sharks does lead to more interaction potential, right? More of something just leads to more interactions. Um, but there are some things that we can help 
hopefully do in the future with some new technology to negate some of those negative interactions. But Uh sharks aren't quite to where they need to be population wise to sustain, especially elsewhere in the world. Yeah. Said for the most part, the United States has done pretty good about managing their their shark populations. Okay. Um, what has been the most interesting thing that the research uh, has has shown you? For me, it is actually seeing where some of these sharks go. So here in the Gulf of Mexico, especially off Texas, we always thought we had a seasonal short fin mako population, and that's not actually the case. Our females stay in the Gulf of Mexico all year long. So do some of our smaller males. Our breeding males tend to leave the Gulf. So we have sharks that go to the Caribbean every summer and sharks that go up to New England every summer. And so it's really interesting to just see how those subpopulations are interacting. Um, Because if I, when I started and I talked to fishermen, shortfin makos were only here in the winter and that's not the case. So that's kind of cool. Interesting. Uh, Like generally speaking, when it comes to sharks, does the male get bigger or female? Female. Okay. We females have to give birth, so they have they need more resources. They get bigger. Uh huh. Um. And okay, that's fascinating. I wouldn't have thought those 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 sharks would end up in New England. But I was looking at the the graph um, from the the link that you sent me, and mm-hmm. it was like you know all the way from uh, our coast here in Texas to like I don't the middle of the Caribbean mm-hmm. and back. Um, they did that. So what's really cool is those two males that left left for two years almost to the exact day like so when they're ready to leave they just leave and they did it two years back to back and both males actually did it within a couple of days of each other so the one that went to new england left like a day before the one that went to the caribbean like it was something triggered it and they they hit the road running do we have any idea of where these sharks um reproduce like where they're no, no idea if it's inshore no. or offshore or no. So it's hypothesized that they are um, mating offshore. We've got a couple of females that have some pretty hefty bite marks, um, which is usually indicative of mating behavior for sharks. So we think there is a breeding population that's happening in the Gulf of Mexico, but we haven't been able to obviously see that. That would be a rare event for us to be able to capture on film. Mm-hmm. What what about as far as other species? Um, what uh, obviously you're just tagging the makos, but do you interact with the the other shark species? And do you, is there any other research going on with them? Yeah, of course. So we actually have a very large tagging program with recreational shark fishermen, um, pretty much anywhere on the Texas coast and some in Florida. We have recreational shark fishermen that actually tag for us. And so to date, they have tagged 10, over 10,500 sharks that we are able to look at seasonal uh, species compositions. We get recapture reports so we can see like how the difference in growth. Um, we're able to tell when we see females, when we see males, size distributions, all sorts of information that we otherwise wouldn't have without these guys. And so they do a, a wide variety of species, um, including sandbars, which is actually one of the species that's more likely to have the depredation events, at least here in the offshore in the Texas area. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, I've spent a little bit of time with some shark fishermen, uh, but generally speaking, they stay up all night long. And I'm just like, I just, I'm, I'm either too old or just don't have it in me to, to yeah, do that they go on a regular hard. basis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah some of these guys go like three or four days and I, yeah i can't do it either i'm yeah. i'm gonna go sleep in the truck wake me up when there's a shark yeah but they have i mean you see huge hammerheads huge bull sharks um makos tiger sharks uh all caught off the coast and and these guys will get them up in the shallows get their picture some of those guys i'm sure are tagging them yep. uh, and then trying to release them but I did hear, and I don't know if this is true, that the hammerheads are like very hard to resuscitate. Yes. So I don't know why. Hammerheads are very sensitive. They uh-huh. fight to the death and they build up lactic acid. So just like you work out, you get sore muscles. They fight till they get so much of that in their bloodstream that they're, it's una- they're unable to resuscitate. Huh. What's been the, the species that you didn't, or that maybe we didn't think we had very many here that, that just pop up randomly? Lemon sharks. Lemon sharks. 
Yeah. So it's weird too, because North Texas seems to see more lemon sharks than South Texas. It's a very rare event that like down pins, we see a lemon shark, but up near Matagorda, I tend to get some lemon shark re uh, reports. Interesting. And then of these, of like with bull shark, with uh, tiger shark, um, hammerheads, are those populations doing well? Yeah, those are the actually, ones that we most com most people like. Oh, I know what that is. You know, like yeah. So most of the iconic species are doing really well, right? So you're a hunter, you understand that you know with management you got to get people on board to conserve species that may be in you know declining, and so you you start with the iconic. Nobody wants to look at the freshwater, the, th the federally threatened snail that I was studying. Like you wouldn't right. even know it existed, but if you saw this big charismatic animal yes, I'm going to save that. I'm going to get behind that. And so, yeah, a lot of those were some of the, the first species to, to really be protected. Not to say that people don't harvest them because they do and we sample them. So we do a variety of research. Um, unfortunately, right now to age a shark, you still have to kill it. And so we actually partner or work with a group of anglers that if their clients are going to go ahead and kill that shark, we go ahead and, and get additional samples we otherwise wouldn't have. So huh. fascinating, yeah. interesting stuff. Um, I think that's most of the information that I wanted to get from you to see if there was anything else that I wanted to ask you. Um, clearly I'll tell you, I talked to Mike about shark depredation. Oh, you did. Uh, yeah. A couple weeks ago on, on his ASA podcast. So it's a hot topic right now. Yeah. Well, and they're just, you know, wh where's the happy median, right? where sharks win and anglers win because at the end of the day anglers are pumping a lot of money into yeah. you know the things that fund conservation just like hunters yeah. um so they we have to keep them satisfied right but yep. not at the detriment of wiping out our shark species so where is that balance i don't know that's what we're always looking for you know so yeah and i think the tackle industry and the fishing industry is is making some headway on that. I really do think some of this gear that we're getting ready to test will be, especially for the recreational side, be really beneficial. We're also going to test it on um, like a headboat and in the commercial industry. And I'm a little more skeptical there just because of the amount of lines that go in the water, but we're going to see, you know, maybe there's a combination of something we can, we can do. Uh -huh. Well, you guys keep pushing the envelope on that front. Uh, it's been great visiting with you. Thanks for educating us a little bit here today. And if you want to give the uh, the website where that link that you sent me is, I'm sure people would find that fascinating to to see how these sharks are moving in, in our uh, waters off the Texas coast. Yeah, so you can actually find out any of our research, inshore or offshore, at sportfishresearch.org. So we have a, a variety of research going on. One other question. Do you guys partner with any other similar uh, research centers across the country? Share we data? Have, yeah, we have lots of partners. Um, pretty well, right now we have a Amberjack count, the great Amberjack uh, count going on, and that's got over 20 co-PIs. So we, we're always partnering with people. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, science is very collaborative. It's not done in a vacuum and it's not done by one individual. So yeah, Amberjack, that's an interesting one too. As yeah. You know, I think for as long as I can remember, the limit's been one, and then there's been years where the season's been uh, so strict that it's not worth going, maybe even closed. Um, is that y'all study amberjack too? No, we do. We study everything. So I'll let you go, but now we're going <laughs> to. Now talk we're going to talk about amberjack. Yeah. Um, yeah. So amberjack is interesting because it's actually been overfished and undergoing overfishing for a long time. And the problem is. Um, all of the management uh, recommendations that have gone in to practice actually haven't truly helped. And so we are currently, this is a follow-up study to the great red uh, snapper count. And so we're now trying to get an abundance estimate for amberjack from South Atlantic all the way through the Gulf of Mexico. And so that project is ongoing. Actually, a group of our researchers are offshore for two and a half weeks um uh doing the that sampling process they just had to outrun um what is it herald yeah. tropical storm herald they just had to outrun herald so wow. yeah um yeah that 
the amberjack one is is interesting is it struggling across its range or just here in the gulf because red snapper you know some people like oh and we've talked about red snapper uh, you know a ton over the years on this show just because of i what i consider the feds overreach of yes we know these fish don't migrate right so this is their reef they're hanging out at maybe they go to the next one they're not going to the florida coast the ones that are off the coast of texas i don't know if amberjack migrate or not Um, amberjack actually migrate a little more than snapper we are tagging um amberjack as well with a diff not a satellite tag a different type of tag but we were able to tag one off of um i believe it was north carolina but it was recaptured in belize oh wow yeah Yeah. so there there have been a, a few more long distance movements than even we would have you know predicted we assume they mixed in western to eastern gulf but not <laughs> from north atlantic to central america do you guys have any data that would support the idea that red snapper do migrate? Uh, so most of our migration stuff for snapper tends to be from inshore to offshore. Mm-hmm. Uh, as they get older, you know, uh, snapper move further offshore. In the colder months, they do come back in a little bit. Um, but storms actually can cause red snapper to have huge movements. And I mean, like from north central Gulf of Mexico all the way over to Florida. Okay. Um so most of their huge movements are due to do due they to come the, back just, when that happens not always huh. yeah not always so there is some data that supports the idea that they can migrate if there's a natural disaster yes but not enough that it would be beneficial to base texas biomass for florida fishes okay perfect perfect well interesting stuff uh what is the what is that website one more time if folks want to check out uh, what yes. you guys are doing uh, sportfishresearch.org. Perfect. Um, well, Dr. Banks, thank you so much for the time today. It's been nice getting to know you and I'm sure we will do this again somewhere on down the road. Yes. Feel free to call us anytime. We're always happy to talk science. All right. Take care. Thank you. You too.